Well, good morning, Thursday Church family. I got a question. You don't have to answer this, okay? But I have a question for you. Completely rhetorical, Bill. Okay. What do cicadas, not being afraid, and following God have in common? I'll let you know in about the course of the next 25 minutes or so. But first, let's go ahead and let's pray and ask God to just speak into our lives, shall we? Heavenly Father, we just come before you. And um, the thing that you're impressing upon me is I need you, Lord, to come in and break my hard heart and my, 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 my thick, scald head. And Lord, these words that you have been placing in my heart and you've been placing before us through the sermon series, it has been really, really hard to live out. But Lord, you're the one who's in control of all of it. And Lord, I just pray that you would just let these words ring in our ears, that you they would not let the Holy Spirit allow these things that we have been learning to just drop them. But Lord, that you would move us into changing in ways that, that we never even would have imagined or seen in our lives so that we can further your kingdom, so we can do the great things that you have planned for us long ago, long before we were ever born or thought of. And Lord, you had a purpose and you have a plan and it is good and it is perfect and it is pleasing. And so Lord, help us follow that plan in all ways. Give us the courage, give us strength, give us the wisdom and the heart's desire to follow you wherever it may lead. And Father God, I just thank you so much for loving someone like me to allow me to follow your plan. Lord, I thank you. I give you praise. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Golly, I didn't mean to go like there to start off with, to be moved by the Lord in that way. All right. So for the past five weeks, we've been looking at Mark Batterson's book, right? Not Safe. That's a, you know, it's a pretty hard title. Things are not safe. And we've, we've been using it as a springboard for our Living on the Edge series. Now, so far what we have learned is that if we're following Jesus' lead, and listen, one of my favorite, it it seems almost redundant, but I loved it, and I didn't come up with it. But I think it was Andy Stanley who said it. Maybe not. I'll give him credit. He said, followers follow. Followers follow. So if we say we're a follower of Jesus, that means we follow Jesus. Yeah. And we don't get to pick and choose when we do that. All right. So we are called upon to follow Jesus. And sometimes what Jesus calls us out to do, what the Lord calls us into doing, never does not feel all that safe. It feels like this rickety bridge right here. Well, that's not rickety enough. It doesn't even hardly move. All right. So anyway, it's, it's like, you know, we get out in the middle of a footbridge. I've never been on one because I got to tell you, I'm terrified of heights. I would never walk this thing. I'm not going to do it. However, Figuratively speaking, Jesus asks us not to stand where it is safe on the edge, but to walk out where he is at. And sometimes it feels like being in the middle of this bridge. We've been talking a lot about this thing, haven't we? One of my very favorite quotes from his book is simply this. We need to quit living as if our purpose in life is to arrive safely at death. I want you to think about that for a minute. Think about what, what, that, what that actually looks like in our lives. We need to quit living as if our purpose in life is to arrive safely at death. You see, I know that to be true because Jesus never said following him would be safe. Nowhere in the Gospels does he ever say, uh, if you follow me, you'll get to arrive safely at death. I don't see that anywhere in there. Nothing even remotely close. Actually said quite the opposite on several occasions. Jesus said things like, in this world, you will have many trials and sorrows. Jesus spoke to his followers about being persecuted. I got to tell you, being persecuted, that doesn't sound very safe at all. Not even a little bit. And that's because Jesus said nothing to the effect that following him would be safe in the here and now. He never once mentioned that. In week two, we looked at the the second part of the Not Safe book called Not Easy. And as followers of Jesus, we're going to be called upon to do tasks for God that are not going to be easy. 
Jesus doesn't call us not just to the unsafe. He doesn't call us to do easy stuff. Tasks where it'll be really hard for us to actually follow through and pull the trigger to do what God asks us to do. We talked about Peter. We actually talked about Peter in the following week, but I'm going to bump him up a week, okay? Forgive me. We talked about Peter uh, stepping out of the boat and onto water. Now, I don't know if about you, but unless the water is frozen, it's not very safe to do. I've done that fishing, you know, especially as a kid. I've cast, and I remember one time I cast and went, whoop, right off the end of the dock. It was, it was kind of hilarious because my dad said, did you even get wet? Because I, I like hit the water and came flying right back out. It's like, boom, psk, out. But what, what Jesus asked Peter to do, to step out of the boat on unfrozen water, was not an easy task. What I look at is that it took two things for Peter, right? It took faith and it took a great deal of courage for him to step out. And I, I look at this in, in a couple ways. You see, the, the first thing is a, he made a statement of faith, did he not? He said, Lord, if, you, if you'll have me to walk out on the water, can I come to you? Statement of faith. Lord, I will go wherever you want me to go. However, that's a dangerous prayer because then you have to have the courage. You have to have the guts to actually do what you just asked. Lord, I'll go wherever you want me to go. And so it took two things for Peter. Not only did it take faith, but it took a great deal of courage to step out of the boat. That was not easy. Faith and faith statements put into action are not easy. In week three, we talked about the fact that going halfway with God is just not a good idea or a good option. Um, Sometimes, let me backtrack. I'll use me. I think for a good chunk of my Christian life, I was trying to go halfway with Jesus Christ. I would follow him to a point, and a lot of times that point would look so it looked good for all of you. But that wasn't good enough, and the Lord did not want to leave me there. Going halfway is not a good option. Jesus is following Jesus is all or it's nothing. He said stuff like, you are either for me or you're against me. Is there any gray area in that? You're for me? No, there's no gray area in that. He also said, if you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you'll find it. In my words, there's no half weighing it with Jesus. It just won't work. Last week, we looked at uh, the fourth section titled, Not My Own. And Pastor Debbie pointed out very powerfully that when we fully embrace Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our life, and when I say our life, every single aspect, aspect of it, all that we have and all that we are don't belong to us. They belong to They belong to him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tells us, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. You see, our salvation was bought at a really high price. Jesus gave up Everything He paid the high price with his life for the forgiveness of our sins. And because Jesus held back absolutely nothing from us in, in order to restore us back into a right relationship with the Heavenly Father, we should not hold back anything from him either. All that we have, all that we are, are his. As the old hymn says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. All right, I know it's a lot of review, but I thought part of my task today was to bring it all together, to take all these parts and kind of mold them into, uh, I guess if I, in some ways, uh, a, a neat package to hand you or to challenge you with. And so here we are. We're at the very last section of Not Safe called Not Afraid. Now, I have to be honest, I kind of feel like I, um, I, got the, I got the short straw. You could say I drew the short straw on this one because if you've read the book, you, um, 
this not, um, not afraid section is all of 10 pages long. Nine and a half, actually. I, well, you know, no one's counting. About nine and a half pages of content I get to pull from. And, well, I'm very glad that they were nine and a half power-packed pages. However, I do find it a little bit ironic that that section is short. I'm not, I'm not criticizing or anything, but I do find it just a little bit ironic because uh, when I read the Bible, it seems like at every turn, I see that God is, is telling people who, when he's calling them to really impossible kind of tasks, hard, unsafe kinds of things, he's having to constantly tell them things like, fear not, do not be afraid. Or Paul telling Timothy, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. We find this kind of stuff throughout the Bible. God is constantly, if you're looking, if you're someone like me who has, I, 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 can, I can allow fear to get in the way. That's why this message is just great for me. But I can allow fear to be an excuse for not traveling where God desires for me to go. And so, uh, so I know for a fact, fear is throughout Scripture. At least God is speaking into people to not be afraid. Let me put it that way. And I believe the reason the Bible is so full of these do not be afraid kind of statements is because God has a way of calling us into these tasks that feel not safe. And the reason he calls us to these tasks that feel unsafe is because his desire for us is to become 100% fully dependent upon him. And I was redundant for a reason, 100% fully dependent upon him, not on our own strength, not in our own will, not in our own power. God does not desire for us to do that. You see, if God calls us people to do what we are capable of doing, things that feel safe to do things in our own strength, then I guarantee you every single time we'll do just that, we'll rely on ourselves and not on God whom he desires for us to rely upon him. We'll do our own thing every single time. However, God's way of cultivating a growing faith in him is to call us into these situations that don't feel very safe. And the hard part is that these unsafe feeling situations will invoke a feeling of fear most often. And it is that fear that causes us not to step out in faith and follow what God asks of us. However, for every follower of Jesus... And it is vital. It is absolutely vital for us to learn to live by faith rather than to live out of fear. We have to learn to live by faith rather than to live out of fear. And we have to figure this out. Otherwise, we won't be very effective for growing the kingdom of God. We have to live out of faith rather than in fear. I don't know about you, but I don't ever want, or I want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. I do not want to hear the words, what did you do with the talent I gave you, you evil servant? I want to live by faith rather than live out of fear of the unsafe. Someone who absolutely, and I know I'm just going, hey, the book does that to you, right? It just, brah, it just goes. But someone who absolutely exemplifies this in the Bible, of having to, to set aside fear in order to accomplish a, a massive task that God has called him to, my mind instantly goes to Gideon. I absolutely love to talk about Gideon because I find it really easy to relate to him. I mean, Gideon is a nothing, there's nothing special about Gideon. In fact, he has a really low opinion of himself. He thinks he's the least of least person in the smallest tribe of all of Israel, why would you call upon him? He does not have a very high opinion of himself. Not only that, but in Judges 6, when we we're first introduced to Gideon, what we read is that he is a man that does not believe that God is really even there for him. I mean, think about that. When you first read about Gideon, he's not even sure God is there for him. I, th I think he believes that God exists. I believe that he believes that, that God is there, but, but where is he at? Man, 
Talk about a low point of faith. And not only that, Gideon has really very little personal experience with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But what I love, and I absolutely love this, is that this doesn't bother God in the least little bit. God meets Gideon right where he is in his inexperienced faith. And God patiently, and I, I, I underline and, and bold and highlighted that word because I think that's key. God patiently grows Gideon into a faith-filled person, step by step. The faith-filled person that he needs him to be in order to do the impossible and set Israel free. Today we're going to look at Gideon's very first leap of faith. And so if you would, grab a Bible, open up your Bible app, whatever it might be. And we're going to look at Judges chapter 6. And we're going to, look at, at, we're going to start verse 25. Um, in your Bibles here on the, on the seats, it's on page 208. All right, so not too long ago, we talked about a judge. Her name is Deborah. Pastor Debbie uh, talked about her. And judges were these people that that God called upon in order to set the Israelites free. And then um, we talked about how the Israelites constantly went through this really ridiculous life cycle. I'll just start at the top for you, okay? The top is life is really, really good. It is awesome. Things are going amazing, right? And so what they do is, you know what? We don't really need God as much. And so they would begin to walk away from him and following him. And when they did that, then what would happen is sin would creep in. And once sin crept in, God would no longer tolerate it. And he would remove his hand of provision and protection from their lives. And when, they, when, when he removed his his hand of of provision and protection, what would end up happening is that would allow another tribe, another group of people to come in and raid Israel and then they would oppress them and they would punish them and they would um, uh, just do all kinds of evil things. In many ways you could say they hit rock bottom. When they finally hit rock bottom, they decided, you know what? Our sin is what is causing this problem. And so then they would cry out to God and they would, they would repent of the sins. And God would hear their repentance. He would hear their cries. And so God would have pity on them and he would send a judge. And the judge would come back in and then he would make, or he or she, that person would make life great again because he would set Israel, he or she, forgive me, would set Israel free. And you all know what happens when life gets good again. And around and around Israel went. I don't know about you, I'm so glad that we've learned from the Israelites that we don't do this kind of thing anymore. Life gets good, and so we slip away from God, then we sin, then we hit rock bottom. I'm so glad we don't go through that crazy life cycle, aren't you? <laughs> Uh, one, of my, one, of, one of my top languages is sarcasm, if you don't know me. Uh, that's my love language. All right, so anyway, I don't think it's in there, but it should be. Anyway, here we are in Judges chapter 6, and we find the Israelites, and they're going through this, this cycle of insanity once again. And uh, this time they're under the oppressive Midianite rule. And it is really bad because the Midianites keep coming in and they keep raiding the Israelites. And they keep, and this time around when they raid, they take everything. They're, like, they're described as locusts. They come in and just basically strip the land bare. They take all the crops, all the livestock, and they remove it all. And they, live the Israel, they leave the Israelites with nothing left to live off of. And so what do they do when they hit rock bottom? They cry out to God, Right? And God has pity on them, and he sends this time around Gideon. He's the one that God calls upon to set his people free. However, to get him to that point, Gideon has to first learn to trust God. And he has to have 20 seconds 
of interesting courage to step out in faith. So Judges chapter 6, starting with verse 25. That night the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd. You know, that one that's seven years old. I don't know about you, but sometimes I need from God specific instructions like these, right? I, no, not that bull, that bull right there. Anyway. Pull down your father's altar to Baal. Cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. And this is very risky. Then I need you to build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, lying stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. And so Gideon took 10 of his servants and he did as the Lord commanded. However, he did it at night because he was... Afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. Early the next morning, as the people of the town began to stir, someone discovered that the altar of Baal had been broken down and the Asherah pole beside it had been cut down. And in their place, a new altar had been built, and on it were the remains of the bull that had been sacrificed. And the people said to each other, Who did this? And after asking around and making a careful search, they learned it was Gideon, the son of Joash. Bring out your son, the men of the town demanded of Joash. He must die for destroying the altar of Baal and for cutting down this Asherah pole. However, here in verse 31, I absolutely love it. You see, in verse 31, we see God's provision and protection over Gideon's life. And here it is. But Joash shouted at the mob, or to the mob that confronted him, why are you defending Baal? I mean, will you argue his case? And to me, this next sentence is almost, I promise you this. That's the attitude I get behind here. Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If Baal truly is a God, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. And from then on, Gideon was called Jeru Baal, which means let Baal defend himself because he broke down Baal's altar. He got a new name because he stepped out in faith. What God was asking Gideon to do was absolutely not safe. And he had every reason to be afraid because Gideon's not an idiot, right? Gideon's not just like, oh, okay, I'm going to go do that. No, I mean, Gideon knows, and we know this because he did what? He was afraid and he went at night. He's not dumb. He went in secret to go break down the altar. However, he still followed God's directions. God didn't say, hey, listen, you got to go in the middle of the day. But he still followed God's directions. Even though he knew the townspeople would be out for his head when they found out, they had torn down their sacred idols. And if you don't know this, people really hate when you mess with their secret idols. They don't like it very much. And so Gideon had every right to be afraid. But as I said, he still faithfully followed God. And because he did what God asked, Gideon experienced God's power and protection firsthand. And I know this is a, he had to experience this because of what God is going to ask him down the road to go and to fight the Midianites with the, and get his army whittled down to like 300 men and to fight an entire army. Gideon has, ha, has to experience this first in order to have that kind of faith to go with 300 men, to, to go and do the task that God is going to ask of him down the road. And this moment was definitely a faith-building, fear-moving moment in Gideon's life, an experience, like I said, that he would need later on. Another reason God asked Gideon to tear down uh, the altar to Baal in this Asherah pole is simply God is jealous for his people. He is absolutely jealous for his people. He does not tolerate other things sitting in his rightful place in our lives. And therefore, some idols had to be chopped down and taken out in Gideon's life in order for God to have his rightful place, both in Gideon's life and in the nation of Israel. Those poles had to come down. That altar had to be removed. And this is true in our own lives as well. The idols that have to be chopped down in our lives, you know, we, they're just kind of a little bit different. 
You know, we don't usually have an altar in our backyard where we do burnt offerings. I, at least I would kind of hope not. Um, we probably do not have an Asherah pole, which I'm not even going to describe to you. You can look it up, I guess. But we don't have these card figurines. We don't usually have these kinds of things in our lives. However, we do have other kinds of idols for sure. One, who is Lord of my life? And I think there are times we're guilty that the idol in our life, the God of our life, is the person that will stand and look back at you in the mirror. That we will place ourselves on, our, on the throne. We'll follow me. I'll do it my way. That's not good enough. Who is Lord of your life? Sometimes there are certain sins that can become our idols, sins that we actually end up worshiping. We feel like we can't live without X, Y, and Z. Like we have to do this, otherwise I don't know what would come of me. And I can tell you from personal experience, removing these idols will feel not safe. It'll feel risky, but it's not. It's not risky at all. It's the best decision you'll ever make to follow Jesus Christ and remove the sin or remove yourself. We'll tell ourselves all kinds of lies. You know, what I'm doing is not really hurting anyone. Or, you know, this, this is all I know. And if I chop down this idol in my life, this thing that I hold so dear and sacred, how I know my life will really be any better than what it is. Regardless of how we might feel, God is still a jealous God who will not tolerate sharing the throne of your heart with anyone or anything else. Therefore, if we desire to follow Jesus, and I told you earlier, followers follow, and if we desire to follow Jesus and do the impossible for his kingdom, then we're going to have to be like Gideon, and some idols are going to have to go. Some altars in our life are going to have to be torn down. All right, let me come at this in a completely different direction, because I, I told you earlier that, you know, what do cicadas and, and not being afraid and following Jesus have in common? So let me come at this in a totally different way. Um, on your seat, we have these things called seat reminders, right? And they're really cool um, because they help us to think about the sermon throughout the whole week so that when we walk out the doors, we don't just forget the main point, right? We can, we can keep living it out, making it a part. So uh, sometimes I have... Um, I would say a creative uh, mind. Uh, however, sometimes the creative mind can become overly creative. And I thought, man, it would be a really cool idea if we um, had as our seat reminder cicada shells. A couple problems. Um, according to the girls, this is what they found, three. So, I mean, we were just shy um, 247 or so uh, cicada shells, but pretty close. And then I started thinking about it a little more. Um, not everyone may appreciate as much as I do cicada shells. <laughs> and uh, I figured if I put those out in the seats, some of you would balk at the idea of having to pick it up so you could sit down. So in my head, I imagined everyone kind of just standing there and um, not really taking a seat or just going, all right, I'm out of here. And then spreading rumors that Thursday church has bugs. And so I thought, I thought, oh, that would be a really, really bad idea. And so I spared you, okay? Um, these are the only cicada shells right here with me. However, uh, the cicada life cycle is a really, really cool analogy to the Christian life. A really powerful visual, at least in my mind. And so I want to share that with you still. To my knowledge, the cicada goes through three major uh, life changes, right? And they start off life as, as lar larvae living underground anywhere from, I think it's 1 to 14 years. If I'm wrong, uh, it's okay uh, on that one. Uh, but I think it's 1 to 14 years they can live underground uh, depending on what species they are. And then when that time and the temperature are just right, they crawl out of the ground and they begin a new life cycle. They go through transformation. 
You know, when, when, when Jesus calls us out of the muck and the mire, which is an analogy for out of the poo of life, when he calls us up out of the ground, out of the muck and the mire, and to follow him, we are transformed into a new creation. However, this is still not where God intended for them, those cicadas, to be in life. You see, in order to live on as a species, in order to reproduce, to keep it going, they are called to fulfill their purpose. And so cicadas were created not just to crawl around the ground. They were created to fly. They were to go through another transformation. But, to, but in order to fly, a cicada has to break away from its old self. It has to be set free even from the transformed life in some ways, and they have to let go of even that past. And they do that because it's not in their DNA to be content with just crawling around. They are created to fly. Figuratively speaking, the life of the cicada is what God desires to do in our own lives. His desire is for us to be transformed, to be set free from our old self, our old ways, our old habits, our old way of thinking, to be set free from the idols that we hold on to so dearly that we need to let go of and destroy. And God loves us too much to even leave us there because he then calls us to follow him into some unsafe tasks in order to set others free, to be able to soar with him, to do impossible tasks for his kingdom. This is what's in the DNA of every follower who follows Jesus Christ, to further his kingdom. However, for us to get to this point of being free, in order to be uh, able to soar with him, to do the impossible, now you can look at your seat reminder, your actual seat reminder, not the cicada shells. And on there, there are three questions we have to answer. And the first and foremost we have to answer is, who really is Lord over my life? And not just bits and parts, every single aspect. Is it me or is it Jesus? It is of utmost importance to ask this question because Jesus was very clear in John 15. He, 15, he said, for apart from me, you can do Nothing. When it comes to kingdom stuff, apart from him, we can do absolutely nothing. And so I ask, who is Lord of your life? The second question we need to ask ourselves is this. What risk is God asking me to take? Where is God asking me to step in, out in faith to do the impossible for him? What's he, gonna, what's he challenging me to do right now, today? Third question. What sacrifices am I going to need to make in order to get there? What's going to have to take place? What do I need to break free from? What, uh, what do I need to let go of in order to go where Jesus is calling me to go? And listen, sometimes the things that God calls us to aren't just idols. Sometimes they're really good things. That's the hard part. So those are the three questions to look at this week. Who is Lord of my life? What risk is God asking me to take? And what sacrifices do I need to make? in order to get there. At the end of his book, Batterson uh, really challenges his readers with just one, one liner. And he simply wrote, you. You are just one unsafe decision away from a completely different life. Just one step out of the boat. One step into the rickety bridge. One unsafe decision to a completely different life. Will you be like Gideon? Will you take that first leap of faith into a life that is wild, purposeful, and fully dependent on our Heavenly Father? Or will you play it safe? And I believe our Heavenly Father is waiting on us to cause us to fly to tear down the astral poles in our life, to take that risk and to do something completely and utterly amazing for him. I firmly believe that. But to get there, we're going to have to set aside our fears and we're going to have to take a leap of faith. A leap that's not going to necessarily feel safe, but I guarantee you this, God is there. If what God is asking you to do is of him, he is there. So jump. Go for it. Do whatever it is he's calling you to do. Whatever amazing thing 
he has in store for you. He is calling on you to further his kingdom.